Okay, so let's give this a go. Uh, we'll try out the system and see if we can understand how it works. And as promised, um, well, I confirmed that uh, you can see the whiteboard in the previous video. I'm gonna try to use it now. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, so aren't you glad that uh, we're doing this all online this semester? You don't have to read my handwriting on a regular basis. It's amazing, huh? Uh, I'm gonna have you try to read this now though. So the idea here is that um, uh, I've got what consequences constrictions at various locations have on both F1 and F2. So for F1, if I wanna raise F1, I constrict at the glottis or somewhere close to it. If I wanna lower F1, I constrict at the lips. For F2, I have two options uh, for both consequences. So for to raise it, um, I can constrict at the palate or the glottis. And to lower it, I can constrict at the lips or the pharynx. I've also got these notes down here on the bottom, which are probably Ill illegible or maybe even unpronounceable. But uh, say um, if you want to raise a formant, you constrict at a velocity node. If you want to lower a formant, you constrict at a velocity antinode. So that helps line up um, these places of articulation with where the nodes and antinodes are in the standing wave. So we can kind of use this as a reference point. Uh, and then I'll say, let's try to figure out how we get to the four corners of the space. So to start off with, uh, we're gonna try to get to um, an E here, a high front vowel. We want to lower F1 and raise F2, and hopefully you can see the whiteboard, and if you can't, you can still go back to previous slides and the lecture notes. Uh, but how do we get there? Uh, how do we lower F1 and raise F2? Um, so you can kind of use the framework at your disposal. It shouldn't be too hard. Uh, but we want to be in this part. We want to lower F1, and we also want to raise F2, right? So some sort of combination of constricting at the lips, palate, and glottis. How do we actually make that work? Um, so to lower F1, constrict close to the lips. To raise F2, constrict at the palate. Um, so here's where the theory gets a little smudgy. Um, but... Uh, for lowering F1, we want to, yeah, actually, I just have the F2 nodes here. Um, so F1 has a velocity antinode here. If we really wanted to lower F1, we would constrict there. Um, we're only going to make one constriction for this valve, though. It's going to be at the palate. So kind of as I mentioned before, um, we're, well, close counts in this game. So we're a little bit closer to this anti-node for F1 than we are to the um, node for F1, which is way back here. So we should get a little um, sort of F1 bang for our buck here just by making a constriction somewhere in the vicinity of this anti-node. What the palate though, um, what that constriction is giving us is a constriction at this velocity node, which should raise F2. Um, we could constrict at the glottis as well. I'll go back to the board. You might be able to see the problem here a little bit better. So we could constrict at the glottis to raise F2, uh, but the issue with that is that that would also raise F1. And so we'd be working kind of at counter purposes by doing both of these things at the same time. So we're able to lower F1 a little bit by getting close to the lips, but not right there. And we're able to raise F2 in theory a lot by hitting right at a velocity node um, for F2. And that should give us E, that sort of vowel. It's basically just a palatal constriction. Okay, let's try another one. What about a high back vowel? What about pushing our formants in this direction? We want to lower F1 and we want to lower F2. So we can look at this. Hopefully you can see that. And we want to be doing this to both formants. Um, and hopefully you can see that there's a connection there, which makes us a little bit easier but we've got some combination of a labial constriction and a pharyngeal constriction. So to lower F1, we can constrict at the lips where we have this antinode. And to lower F2, we can also constrict at the lips or we can constrict at the other antinode for F2, um, which is in theory supposed to be in the pharynx. Um, so we saw a diagram in the previous uh, half of this lecture about where the tongue is positioned when you actually produce a high back vowel like ooh. Um, Ooh's constriction is supposed to be back here um, in this sort of velar region, uh, which is not exactly where this pharyngeal antinode is. Um, so like I said, this gets a little fudgy too. Uh, <laughs> in some respects, you can think, well, if I'm ooh, if I'm rounding my lips, I extend my vocal tract a little bit, uh, and that would sort of bring this 
anti-node a little bit forward. So if I'm constricting sort of by this anti-node, I kind of get that combination of effects. Uh, ooh, um, to lower both F1 and F2. I'll add, however, you can kind of play around with this, right? Um, we know from descriptions of English vowels in 341 that in a lot of modern varieties of English, speakers have fronted oohs or more fronted oohs than might be expected from the canonical representation of the vowel in English. So we don't often say ooh. Uh, we often say things more like ooh uh, or ooh. Uh, maybe not quite all the way towards the front, but the idea is the more you sort of shift this highest arch of your tongue from a pharyngeal position like ooh uh, to more of a palatal position like ooh, um, you get a higher F2. That's why you have um, that effect of F2 when you're moving forward in the space. And for most of us, um, it's probably somewhere in between that those extremes of ooh and ooh uh, and like, like ooh, right? So this is a reasonable place to expect there to be a um, constriction for that vowel. For English speakers, it's not exactly hitting the extremes of the acoustic or articulatory space though. But that's why, um, is because to lower these formant frequencies, you wanna hit these anti-nodes and we're getting reasonably close to get the acoustic effect. Okay, let's try a third one. Uh, we're gonna go in the opposite direction. We wanna go to the low front part of the space. To do that, we have to raise both formant frequencies, and we can kind of go back to this if it's helpful at all. How do we raise things? We are on, on this column here. So we want to have some sort of combination of a glottal uh, constriction and a palatal constriction, right? Um, yeah, so to raise F1, we want to constrict close to the glottis. There's a node down here. And to raise F2, we want to constrict close to the glottis and also constrict at the palate. And this is sort of what we do, like a low front vowel is like, ah, right, ah. Um, you kind of wind up constricting at your glottis by just sort of lowering your jaw, ah, ah, if you really want to get down there. Um, and maybe you shift up your tongue a little bit to this palatal region to kind of get that extra um, boost of uh, an F2 raise as well. But if you constrict at the glottis, you kind of get both of those things um, in one fell swoop, ah. Yeah, so that's why this is a low front vowel. The glottis part is the low part of it and the front part of it is uh, the palatal um, articulation as it were. Okay, and we got one more to work through. Where do we make a constriction to get to the low back part of the space for a vowel like ah? And for that, we need to do two different things. We wanna raise F1 and we wanna lower F2. So to raise F1, we should be here in the glottal region and to lower F2, we need to be producing some sort of combination of a labial and pharyngeal constriction. Um, maybe, right? So perhaps you can see where these constrictions might also work at cross purposes and how it can kind of resolve the potential conflict. So to raise F1, we can constrict near the glottis, maybe not right at it, but if we're closer to it than we are to the lips, we're gonna raise F1. Uh, and to lower F2, we can constrict at this velocity anti-node in the pharynx. We're not rounding our lips here for ah, so uh, we don't have to worry about this thing shifting around at all. Um, but this basically gives us kind of, this one constriction will give us both of those acoustic effects, uh, like I said, in one fell swoop. So we're a little bit nearer the glottis here than to the lips, that will raise F1. And we are right at a sweet spot, an anti-node for velocity for F2, so that's gonna lower F2. Uh, we don't really want to constrict at the lips here uh, if we're trying to hit sort of the extremes of the space because if we lower at the lips or constrict at the lips, that will lower F1 as well as lowering F2. Um, and we already said that we want to raise F1 to get to that low back part of the space, right? So we don't want to counteract that constriction. And this pharyngeal one uh, gets us both effects, more or less. Okay, so like I said, you can kind of shift around both formants independently, uh, but there is some interaction between the two that you have to take into consideration, or that as just speakers of a language, we have learned how to take into consideration to get to, to the acoustic effects we want to produce. So what winds up happening here is you can kind of describe the four quadrants of the space, the vowel space, here's our schwa, 
um, or at least my schwa, and then you can describe these four vocalic portions of the space with respect to individual articulatory positions. So like the high front vowels are palatal, the high back vowels, a good way to get there is with a labial constriction, which incidentally is kind of why these vowels tend to be rounded in general. For a low back vowel, you can uh, make a pharyngeal constriction to produce an ah, and for a low front vowel, it's more glottal. Yeah, so that kind of helps simplify things a bit while still providing us some understanding of what's going on uh, kind of behind the scenes. I mentioned F3 briefly, I think on the previous half of this lecture. Um, F3 distinctions are not that common, I think as we already know, but they're possible. Um, the reason that they're uncommon, there's actually more than one reason that they're uncommon. So uh, there's acoustic reasons why uh, we don't often see F3 distinctions. So on the one hand, we have um, the intensity of the harmonics in the complex wave of voicing. They tend to drop off in intensity when you can go up the frequency scale, right? We saw that kind of parabolic path that they normally take from low frequency harmonics to high frequency harmonics. Uh, we've also described this as spectral tilt. They just kind of consistently go down. That's how the complex wave is formed. So at those higher frequencies, you have less overall acoustic intensity. It's kind of harder, harder to transmit a distinction that way to a listener. There's also auditory reasons why listeners are just not able to pick up on those as easily as lower frequency formats. So uh, our sensitivity auditorily just drops off at those higher frequency regions. Um, We'll learn more about that when we talk about audition towards the end of the semester. Uh, something, an interesting um, fact about, uh, say, the vowel E is that uh, F2 is pretty high and F3 is higher, but it's not that much higher above it. Um, so somebody somewhere along the way did a uh, experiment where they were able to set up a system that had like an F1 that was appropriate for E, and then they uh, had some sort of dial that um, listeners could tune basically to get um, different second form values. And they uh, asked listeners in this experiment to say, well, tune that dial until you get to what sounds like an E to you. And what people would do is they would tune the frequency of F2 and F, uh, F2 to basically be halfway between where we normally see F2 and F3 for uh, an E when it's actually produced. And so that kind of suggests that um, these two are both useful for the perception of an E and um, also kind of merge to a certain extent um, auditorily because we want to have some energy kind of somewhere in the middle of the where they're normally found uh, in the frequency scale. Anyways, at the higher frequencies, we're losing acoustic intensity. We're also losing auditory um, sensitivity. So it's not a great place to be putting formants to get them heard um, properly or to distinguish them from some other sounds uh, in the world's languages. But let's say we did want to do that, uh, mess around with F3. We could say decrease F3 to get it to sort of a frequency, uh, part of the frequency scale where uh, acoustic intensity is higher and our auditory sensitivity to that frequency is uh, a little bit better. So where would we make distinctions if we wanted to do this? Uh, and this kind of brings us back to these bottom notes, these scribbled notes here, which describe to you the basics of the system, that constriction at a velocity node raises a formant, constriction at a velocity antinode lowers a formant. We want to lower F3, so where can we make constrictions? We need to make them at velocity antinodes, right? So in this diagram, it would be somewhere here. Um, somewhere here at this antinode and then somewhere here at this antinode. <clears throat> you can conceive of these as being at the lips, somewhere in the velum, uh, velar region, and then also kind of in the lower pharyngeal region. As I mentioned before with ooh, if you are constricting your lips, these other uh, antinodes will be pushed forward a little bit in the vocal tract tube. So these other two constrictions might be a little bit further forward. So we might get constrictions here here in sort of the post-alveolar or palatal region, and then here maybe in a more forward pharyngeal uh, place of articulation. And it turns out this is exactly actually where we get constrictions for a sound like er in English. Bird. Uh, like this one where you can see that F3 descends quite a bit. Bird. It's actually kind of sitting on top of F2, how convenient. Um, er, er in English uh, has bilabial, 
post alveolar and pharyngeal constrictions. The post alveolar constriction comes in the form of a retroflex articulation, er, but it's right there, kind of where you'd expect the antinode for F3 to be, along with the other two antinodes as well. So uh, this brings me to this catchphrase synergy, which used to be a cool thing to say in the corporate world back when I was a grad student. Maybe it still is. Synergy is um, a term, again, based from the ancient Greek language that means working together. So erg means work in ancient Greek, syn means together. Synergy is when you get two different articulations working together to sort of produce the same acoustic effect. And in fact, for F3, you get three different articulations working together to produce the same um, effect. And uh, similarly, we get uh, a synergy with U, where we get labial and velar constrictions, both lowering F1 and F2. These sort of synergistic expressions are something that the perturbation theory can um, capture nicely uh, with its sort of multiple node um, representation, multiple anti-node and node representation of standing waves. Uh, it's a lot easier to explain why we're getting more than one articulation for a vowel in this theory than it is in the two tube model, which we'll cover next. Um, and I'll, ha I'll end with this little note here, which I kind of alluded to anyways, but labial velar vowels are far more common in the languages of the world than either just labial vowels by themselves or velar vowels by themselves. When you do get the potential to have articulations working together to produce an acoustic effect, human beings will take advantage of that situation. They will use both. To some extent, they will shy away from articulations that kind of work against each other, but if there's a possibility to get them work together, we like that because uh, we want to get the maximum um, efficacy out of our efforts in the world. Um, you can call that laziness or you can call it efficiency. I'll leave it up to you. And I'll leave you with that thought. So I'll see you next time to look at this perturbation theory again from a slightly different perspective. See you then.